Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you're joining from. Um, on behalf of the Data Science for Everyone Coalition, welcome to Chart the Course, our work to build national learning progressions for data science and data literacy education. Um, well, we mo uh, wait for more folks to join and transition from their other commitments and hop into Zoom here. Uh, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, so please share your name, organization, and why you're interested in joining the event today. We'd love to hear from you. Um, my name is Eric Drosa. I'm the Executive Director of Data Science for Everyone. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about DS4E, we are a national initiative coalition and community based at the University of Chicago, uh, striving to catalyze the adoption of data science and data literacy education as a basic component of K-12. Um, originally catalyzed from a free economics podcast, uh, the push for data literacy has be since become a national movement um, with more than 3,000 education leaders uh, and now 27 participating states across the country. And we're, we're so excited to see so much momentum over just the past couple of years. Um, we currently work on four big things. Uh, it's raising awareness, gathering and catalyzing classroom resources, community building, and then policy work as it relates to data science and data literacy education. Uh, before we get started today, I'd also like to remind everyone about the DS4E community standards. Um, we welcome a coalition members of all different backgrounds and levels of experience with data science education. And to create room for a healthy and engaging debate, we've established a code of conduct that creates an environment of uh, respect, inclusion, and effective communication. You can learn more about the community standards, including how to report any violations that might occur um, on our website. And we'll also drop a link to that in the chat now, so you can take a look at them in case you need to reference them at any point. Um, we are so excited because, as I mentioned at the outset, a growing number of states across the country are implementing data science education in K-12 schools nationally. Uh, most data science education programs have developed independently and organically over the past uh, number of years and represent different conceptions of data science education from state to community. Um, as a result, uh, DS4E has recognized that there's a growing need and opportunity to provide all of these states on the map here um, with a comprehensive data science education learning framework that everyone can draw from as a model um, to use as an example as they're building their own experiences for students locally. Um, throughout spring and summer 2024, Data Science for Everyone coordinated a series of focus groups to develop an initial set of learning outcomes for K-12 data science education, broadly defined. Um, we gathered input from a breadth of stakeholder groups, including representatives from higher education, industry, K-12 classrooms, state departments of education, and students themselves, um, who frankly, um, I will tell you all, had some of the most impressive draft learning targets uh, compared to all the other adult groups. Um, and I just want to give a really special shout out to, that, to the student group who joined us and helped us draft some of their preferred learning competencies and targets they would like to see in their own K-12 education experience. Um, these are students who had graduated recently from high school and wanted to get back to the, you know, the, the education sector that they had uh, just left. Um, today's event is about sharing the early, early results of those efforts. Um, you'll hear directly from some of the amazing educators and other leaders who've been at the forefront of this work as they walk us through the key learning outcomes that they identified uh, were essential for all students to learn by the time they graduate from high school. These outcomes are also more than just the list. Um, they really represent a collective vision from multiple disciplines for how we can prepare our students to thrive in a data and AI driven future and to be informed citizens in an information world um, and navigate the vast amounts of information and data that they'll encounter in their daily lives. Um, as you can see on the slide here, you know, any one of these outcomes could be looked at from multiple subject disciplines. And we're really excited to be discussing the interdisciplinary nature of data science education, how it spans across math, science, social studies, uh, and computer science and, and other school subjects as well and how these different subjects intersect and support one another in building a comprehensive understanding of data and all that we can learn from it. Um, but our work doesn't just stop here. Uh, we've launched Chart the Course public uh, campaign, and now we need your input. And we're going to go much broader across the sector um, to refine these draft learning outcomes even further and try to capture anything that we might have missed. Um, your perspectives are invaluable to this work, and by participating in this process through voting on the draft outcomes, uh, you're going to help us shape the education of future generations and redefine what K-12 emphasizes in our content across school subjects to get us ready for you know, 21st century context and environments. Um, and uh, you're going to receive a digital I voted sticker if you participate in the voting tool. So we encourage you all uh, to take some time to fill that out. And we'll talk a little bit more about the process and what that entails as we go through the webinar. Um, I'm really excited to see where today's conversation will take us. 
Um, and again, just huge thank you for being here and for your commitment to advancing data science education for all students. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our lineup for speakers who participated in our focus group process earlier this, this year over that first uh, six month chunk. Um, from our math educator focus group, we, are, uh, we have Dustin Purdy uh, with over 17 years of experience teaching math in rural, urban, and online settings, and who's currently uh, teaching uh, K-12 mathematics at Dwight Global Online School, in addition to serving as a diversity and inclusion coordinator and a curriculum instruction coach. It's a full plate. Um, Dustin is passionate about transforming mathematics education and creating an equitable and inclusive space where all students can learn, grow, and thrive in the subject. Uh, from our social studies group, we have uh, Jennifer uh, Syed, who taught English and social studies at the elementary through high school levels in both public urban and private Islamic school settings for over 25 years, and is currently pursuing her doctorate in teaching and learning at Southern Methodist University. We're all rooting for her PhD thesis. Uh, her current work uh, research focuses on how integrating traditionally marginalized voices into world history education prepares students for citizenship in a multicultural democratic society, just like the U.S., Representing the science group uh, is Cayenne Butler, uh, who taught biology and chemistry courses, as well as middle school, middle school sciences in Texas, Louisiana, and Washington, D.C., and Maryland, uh, and recently transitioned into an administrative role in secondary education as a science instructional specialist. And then finally, from our computer science group, we have Elizabeth Nam uh, Name, a former high school teacher and now a data scientist and career coach. Um, as a data coach at Multiverse, she helps people from non-traditional backgrounds land high paying careers in tech through professional apprenticeships. So thank you all so much uh, for joining me today. And not only today, but earlier this year as we tackle the question, what should every student know about data by the time they graduate uh, from high school? Um, as we reviewed the outcomes and feedback from these focus groups, several key themes emerged. And I'd love for us to, uh, for that to be a focus of our discussion today. And um, I wanna start with a question that pertains to all of you, uh, interdisciplinary integration, right? This whole idea of how can we get more connections between the school subjects, especially as they get more siloed as you go into high school. Um, there's a really strong consensus on the need for data science education to be interdisciplinary. That was one of the biggest takeaway themes of the June summit we hosted in Chicago. Um, educators across subjects highlighted how data science and data literacy skills are relevant, not just in isolation, but better in the context of math and social studies and science and computer science. Um, and the ability to analyze data and draw meaningful conclusions is obviously just essential across all these disciplines, right? It's so core to research and, and how we draw meaning from knowledge. Um, so to all of you, uh, the first kind of round robin question that we have um, is what challenges or opportunities do you see in integrating data science across your respective disciplines? Um, and Jennifer, maybe we wanna start with you and then we can just kind of move around the here. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the big challenge for social studies teachers is actually, actually that um, social studies is really seen as a very text-based discipline and um, social studies teachers don't tend to get into anything that's that's related to data or numbers or math. I used to have my elementary school students convinced that I taught social studies because I didn't know how to do math. So um, and, and that, that mindset is present in a lot of, a lot of us, um, not all of us, but in a lot of us. So we need to kind of, um, I think we need a bit of a mind shift on that. Yeah, I can go next. So I think one of the biggest challenges for math is how do we make data science and identity? Do we make it as its own course or do we make it as an integration into other mathematics courses like statistics? Um, unlike other subjects, mathematics is one of those kind of funnel down fields where when you get to 12th grade, we funnel everyone into calculus. So you don't have a lot of options and pathways to choose from when you're a senior, right? All the other topic, all the other disciplines have so many choices. And so um, incorporating data science as another possible option in 12th grade or for seniors as moving forward gives students more choice and, and, and voice. Um, but I think it's also important to integrate some of those key aspects of data science into the lower grade levels too. So students come up with the you know foundation and background knowledge to be successful for a course in data science. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, Karen, do you wanna jump in and then we'll go to Elizabeth? Sure, I was gonna say, I kind of, I was gonna say some of what Dustin already said. Um, at the high school level, I noticed that in the higher grades, there aren't very many options 
for seniors and even juniors, unless you're in a specific pathway. A lot of the foundational science courses, when they when the teachers t even talk about data, it's very experimental based, kind of controlled, where it's specific to like a certain content area or subject area, where we know now that data is actually very broad and it goes across many different disciplines. Um, it incorporates more than just biology or chemistry or physics, you know? So I would like to see kind of where they can, students could still get that foundational, but sort of a more broader approach to data science, looking at, well, how does it apply in other areas? How does it apply in social studies or English or math? And kind of get teachers to understand how to approach it from that lens instead of it just being in isolation to whatever their standards are. Right, we know that quantities across the disciplines, right? <laughs> They're just as relevant in biology as they are in math class. Um, awesome, and Lizzie, do you want to close us out with a quick thought on this question? Sure, yeah, I, I mean, for me, I'm thinking back to when I taught uh, computer science and um, just, for all teachers, it's scary to introduce something new. Um, so I think one of the things that comes to mind is just the hesitation and reluctance from teachers who have so much on their plates already and have so many demands on their time to learn this new thing. And we often don't have the infrastructure supporting those teachers or the PD or the necessary investment, right, in teacher trainings from the from teacher prep programs through to, you know, your Friday PD um, at school. So I think that that represents a challenge. Um, and I'm sure that doesn't speak to you all in the audience because you're here because you really care about it, but you may, maybe that sounds familiar thinking about some of your colleagues. Um, and so I, I think uh, to the other part, did we talk about opportunities yet or is that coming up? You can mention them now if you, if you see some. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that leads to an opportunity and just in terms of creating space for true collaboration amongst teachers, right? So I may be a social science teacher wanting to integrate data and I can do that in my own classroom, but I can also collaborate with the CS teacher um, and we can, you know, come up with projects that relate to both contents. That's one of the beautiful things about data science. Um, is it just naturally, as as you meant, as some of you have mentioned before, just goes across disciplines? Um, I think the other big challenge is just getting a sense of urgency, again, with the need to do this right now. Um, and so, so yeah, how do we how do we tie this to you know our students' economic prospects and and their material gains to be had from from learning these skills? No, that, that's that's yeah. perfect. And Lizzie, that was also a perfect segue to, to my next question because it's like speaking of things that are um, there's there's both opportunities and risks and, and things that are intimidating. You know, one of the main conversations and a huge theme at the summit was preparing students for a future increasingly influenced by AI, artificial intelligence, um, right? And I know that again, again, the focus groups emphasize the need for students to understand AI concepts and ethical considerations and practical applications with, with data science and literacy being one of the, almost like a building block for one of those other new and uh, fast moving intimidating things. Um, and I'm curious, you know, especially coming from like the, the framework of being informed digital citizens, like Jennifer, like this was particularly prevalent in the social studies group, right? When we worked through and draft outcomes as we were coming through, uh, trying to develop ideas over those couple months. And I, just like reading from a couple of the ones that we had developed as a group, um, we said students will critically assess AI models for recognizing inherent biases. That was one. Uh, students will be able to recognize how data can be manipulated, misrepresented, or reinterpreted by individuals uh, in communication to others. Um, we had students will assess ethical issues related to data, including data security, privacy, transparency. Um, so I'm curious, you know, just kind of in this like new, very fast moving landscape, could you speak more about the importance of uh, some of that content showing up in what we define as data science or data literacy education? Yeah, sure. So I think these things were important to the social studies group because we were really thinking about how we're going to train our students as citizens in the future, citizens of the future, I guess we could say. Um, so looking at those current debates in AI, so we were really 
we wanted students to understand how there's biases and cultural biases in AI and to really be able to critically assess that so that they they understand that sometimes the the um, biases that they're seeing in society are reflected to that and who has power in these different relationships. So these are some of the different concepts that are really important for students to understand in social studies. And I think sometimes they think those are very separated from something like data science because they see that as something very finite and very exact, like it's a science, right? So it's exact. So um, having them understand that was really important to us. Um, in terms of the second one you asked me about was the, oh, how data is manipulated, right? So again, training them for, for citizenship because they're gonna be making decisions. Um, you know, I, I taught high school for the past few years. So when I'm teaching those students, I'm talking to people who are gonna be voting in a couple of years. So they need to, again, be trained for that job, that very important job of citizenship in a democratic society. Um, and then I think the last one, one that you asked about was the data security. And so again, like social studies, I think we have so many different angles that we come to it from. Um, really the first one being that they're going to be looking at this data, but then they're going to be using this data, right? So again, they're gonna be citizens, they're gonna be in this society, they're gonna be making decisions. So they need to see it as a moment in history. And so how they're going to look at that moment in history and how they're going to see the impact of that moment in history. So, you know, hopefully we're teaching them the skills in social studies to be able to look at that as a moment in history and become those decision makers of the future. Yeah, that, that, that's so helpful. And I also appreciate what you said about kind of um, dislodging this idea of data science being a, a, a perfect science with very regimented rules. I mean, in a lot of ways, the problem solving so cycle that is behind some of this content that we're trying to forward has to deal with the, the fact that the world is full of uncertainty and ambiguity and things that aren't super clear, right? And then we have to draw out insights from a, a world of a lot of different variables. Um, but I, I really, and I wanted to make sure I read some of the draft outcomes from the social studies group, because I think um, we, we have to make sure those, those perspectives aren't lost when we're trying to build these experiences for students. And speaking of students, um, I think focus groups also discuss the need to make data science education really relevant to students' own lived individual experiences and their personal interests and their passions. Um, and this is really particularly important to our focus group of college students, um, who I mentioned earlier at the outset, right, who reflected on their own recent high school careers as they were developing their own list of target outcomes. Um, and I really think by using like real world data and engaging students with issues that matter to them, uh, you know, educators, and I'm sure you all have seen this in your own classrooms, right? You can gain such a, a deeper connection and motivation to learn. Um, and so, like Dustin, I'm gonna throw this one to you. Um, oftentimes we hear from students about the relevancy of math or some of the challenges of making math relevant. Mm -hmm. um, so how can data science education lead to some more engagement in the, in the subject? Yeah, well, thank you for the question, Zarek. Um, you know, and just to kind of start, you know, being a math educator for, for 18 years, you know, I've seen, I've felt, and I've lived how um, mathematics instruction has been delivered in our country. And mathematics is often a subject that students don't see as relevant, um, and they don't see it as important and meaningful to them, because we deliver it in a way that it's this, you know, remote algorithm based structure of systems right and we're looking for a right or wrong answer um so i think you know being part of this focus group um i really um, believed in that making data science relevant to students lived experiences is crucial you know when we incorporate real world data and engage students in issues that matter to them whether that's social justice climate change economics or personal interests you know, we create opportunities for deeper connections and increased motivation to learn. You know, and by anchoring the learning process in data that students can relate to, we transform those abstract concepts into things that students can see tangible into problems of their own lives. Um, and this really helps bridge that gap between the classroom and the outside world and making data science both meaningful and impactful. You know, we've seen this in the NCTM's position statements on data science and in their recent publication on high school mathematics and the importance of re-engaging and reinventing and making math relevant. And I think this um, underscores the idea that when students see the direct impact of data and solving real life problems, they not only become better mathematicians, but also more informed citizens capable of navigating this, you know, data-rich world that we live in. 
Um, you know, and, and embedding those data science into our teaching practices, I think we can equip students with the skills they need, you know, to understand and influence the world around them. Um, you know, I know, you know, a couple ways, some things that I've done in terms of engaging my students, you know, just using data uh, for things that are that they're interested, right? And a lot of students are interested in sports and stats, you know, so we I've looked at, you know, some different statistics, um, some, some information, you um, uh, one of the, the activities I do is from UCube's data science course and looking at Steph Curry and where is he, you know, most applicable on the field? Where does his percentage shots the best? Um, and I've also used um, data sets from um, like SKU, um, the script, um, and, and, you know, answering questions like who is the greatest NBL, NBL player of all time? You know, so those types of things when you use real world data. Um, based on their interests to really engage students and motivate them. And they start to see math as relevant and not this disconnected subject that is on its own. It doesn't connect to, to other fields as well. That's awesome. And I love the examples you pulled out because like, I, I could just imagine myself being a middle schooler <laughs> finding relevance in those topics, right? Um, and I, I think that's like a, that, that's a perfect um, connection to another subject that I think came up a lot at the summit. Um, and think about how to engage students early on in their academic careers, right? Because there's so much research out there showing that student identities and student choices about what they care about, what they're interested in form pretty early. Um, so I think we want to make sure we give we give voice to we give, you know, do some really deep thinking around that. Um, you know, the, the foundational knowledge will help students build critical thinking skills and then hopefully prepare them for even more advanced topics in the later years. Um, so, uh, you know, Kayan, I'm wondering, like, you know, given this theme came up really frequently in the science group, um, in particular, um, and and I think something that really I think transitions well at earlier years is the importance of the data cycle. It means students will be able to use data to explain, infer, and predict phenomena, and use data to build conclusions and arguments, right, in a cyclical pattern. Um, and you know, with your experience, you know, can you explain how this concept evolves from and, you know, even elementary to middle, then high school? Because I know this already shows up to a certain extent in the science curriculum. Yeah, and we talked about that a lot, I think, in a couple of our conversations. In uh, the middle school grades, um, the standards are really very broad to where the focus is just on thinking about data in terms of the scientific method, right? So like sixth graders, seventh graders, the focus is uh, a lot of times teacher driven where there's a, there's a beautifully prepared testable question. And it's like, okay, we're gonna test our hypothesis. We're gonna do an experiment. We're gonna collect this data. Well, what is this data? This is information that we can analyze and look at. And that's gonna help us draw a conclusion to either prove or disprove our hypothesis. And it's kind of this idea that um, there's only one way to use the data and there's only one outcome that you should have, like there's a right answer. And I feel like in the earlier grades, it's kind of gauges towards that way of thinking that there's only one way to look at the data and there's a right answer at the end of the cycle. And you're gonna get, you should get this outcome that there couldn't be anything different. And then when you get into biology, chemistry, upper high school courses, even with the state standards, it turns into more of a, well, let's look at the different types of data. There's quantitative and qualitative. Let's look at the methodology. There's different ways to collect it. And then even the ethical implications, like the integrity of the data, or how about analyzing data that's already been collected and thinking about how that compares to what we're doing. So it's like going from just the basics of the cycle to understanding that it's really a continuum and that data is really fluid. It's not really that concrete. And sometimes data collection triggers more questions because science is about inquiry. So it's okay at the end of the process to have more questions than you had in the beginning. And hey, you know, let's go and look at this. Let's talk about it. That it's actually not that concrete. And that 
not all data out there in the social media world is really that reliable. And let's talk about that. Let's talk about sampling and all of those different ways to collect data. So I feel like when you get into the higher grades, you kind of talk about that more. But even so, I feel like it's still very limited. There's still a whole lot more that we can include to help students kind of understand the full package of what it really is, and that it it really does shape a lot. What I learned in this experience is it shapes a lot of how we see the world, really. It's not just through one lens. Like, we have to really modernize our curriculum to speak to how data is used in the working world, no matter what field you go into. So I feel like from middle school grades, it's kind of focused on the scientific method in that one cycle in high school grades it kind of broadens a little bit but I still feel like there's much to be done with how we can incorporate it in and even uh thinking about uh what if I don't get data is that still data that I didn't get anything at the end and and the answer is yes sometimes you can go through an experimental process or a study and you don't get any data and let's talk about that and let's use that as a platform for, you know, something else to study. So I think kind of looking at it more as a fluid idea versus this concrete beginning, middle and end. But that's a mindset that I think is important for the teacher as well. I think a lot of times just in our pedagogy, it's kind of like, oh, we have this set experiment we're going to do and this is what the end is going to do. So I think it has to change from the teacher lens as well so that the students can begin to see a more broader view of what it is and how to use it effectively. No, that, that was so well said. And I, I want to like pull two things out. I think um, first, I can't emphasize enough to the audience, like how much of a learning experience this was for everyone in the room, because <laughs> it's, well, at, at least for the middle and high school folks, like it is so rare that you get this different school subjects to come together and like exchange ideas, exchange standards, syllabi, or et cetera. And I think we really started to see some content connections emerge that we could be there if we just dialed things up a little bit. I know K-5 educators are like super familiar with this and you know, we're like all, the rest of us are rookies. <laughs> we're thinking about how the subjects blend, but I just thought that was, that was a great experience. Um, and, and we learned a lot from each other, I think, as we were trying to do this, build, build out this framework. Um, the other thing that I wanted to add, um, just on, on kind of what you said there, um, is this importance of teacher mindsets um, and I think uh, we both had a pre-submitted question, and then also I saw a thought from Andrea in the chat. Um, but the, the pre-submitted question was, what can educators do to further advocate for data literacy, science literacy, this, this like research, the cycle idea in the middle grades? Um, it seems that educators continue to be hesitant to implement these really important objectives within their science curriculum. Um, and I think Andrea also uh, kind of spoke to the, the idea of educators who are fearful of data or just might not be as confident with that with that concept. So um, I'll open this up to the group. I know, um, Ken, you might already have a few thoughts, um, but that, that was one of the, I saw that couple pop up a couple times in questions. Yeah, well, I wanted to kind of add on to something that Kai has said too, and then kind of sure. answer that question a little bit. You know, I feel like, you know, one of the, the things that teachers struggle with is the idea of uncertainty um, and mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, implementing something for the first time. And when you think of something from a mathematical lens, um, there's usually always one right answer, right? And if you don't get the answer that your model can't be right. But the idea is, is that data and statistical models are ish, right? There's not a perfect model for something. And it's okay to not know what the answer is going to be ahead of time, but to be uncomfortable with that, that uncertainty with your students and, you know, instill in them that, listen, I'm here learning with you. I'm a facilitator, but I'm not the, the giver of all knowledge. I don't know everything, right? You're experts with me as well. And we're in this together. We're learning about it together. So I don't know the answer. I'm not sure if that's right or wrong. Let's explore it together. When you do that, you start to shift that, you know, mindset of that hierarchy, you know, hierarchy, you know, thing where like, the teacher is only the person with the, the knowledge, but no, we're all experts in this together. Um, so that was just kind of one thought that I had in terms of how we, you know, address it. We have to just get with ourselves and, and embrace that uncertainty and uncomfortable level. 
that sounds right to me. Yeah, Jennifer, you want to jump in? Oh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, and it's a little bit related to what um, Dustin was saying, too, you know, getting rid of that mindset that the teacher has the answer. Also, um, schools and districts and, and state standards allowing teachers to to have a voice in, in the curriculum and a voice in the room and respect them as professionals who know what they're doing and giving them that space to try different things. Um, I was in a school that gave me that space to try different things. And that's really how I was able to really start um, doing this in a social studies environment. And I think when teachers do have that space and they have opportunities, sometimes it's not just the space, but it's also the ability to go out and, and get the the training that you need and, and the different resources that you need to do it. And so I think that's something that we really have to let teachers be the professional in the room also. Um, and yeah, and I just wanted to, to clip on one more little thing to that is that, you know, again, what Dustin was saying about being um, really relevant in math classes and a lot of the projects he was talking about, those are projects that you can do in a social studies class too. So that, that whole interdisciplinary thing, I just wanted to kind of re reiterate that. That's really helpful. And I, I think I've been surprised by as we've moved through this process, how there is a there is not a good connective tissue between getting practitioner and even, even student input right into the education policy making process. Um, but I think as a, as a muscle, we need to build more regularly into the system. So I'm really excited that you all are seeing that that need here and that we can try to address it at least through at least through the, the vehicle of data science education. Awesome. Any other thoughts on this question? Otherwise, Jennifer, I have a I have a very specific question for you on social studies resources. <laughs> if you're game yeah, for I'd it, like, I'd like to offer something if you don't mind. Um, it's me. Hello. <laughs> uh, I I used to be a college professor, and so I've taught uh, high school students that have come into college and they're trying to learn things. That I've taught graduate students who have tried to do the same. I worked for you know forty years in the business world as well. And the thing that's missing, I think, in, in the educational preparation and in the literacy fields as well, is getting people to talk about why the stuff that they're teaching students matters or how you could use it. And absent those two things, when people see a graph or when they see technical data, they get they get they turn off. They don't want to think about it. And that's because there was a lot of memorization in under in high school and K through 12. And so asking why or how will this be used is an important thing uh, to do and, uh, and to get a lot of educators to build that into their education, whatever level. Any quick reactions from the panel? Okay, I missed that there, first part. <laughs> I, I know, um, no, no, that, that was helpful, I think. Um, I've heard that question of, you know, why am I teaching this or why am I learning this from students so many times? I know when, when we've at least seen some of the early data science programs implemented, I mean, that question goes away. <laughs> and we're really excited to see like that shift. Um, and, and then just a gentle reminder to, to the audience, if you do have questions or comments, please uh, drop them in the chat. We'll try to go through one by one because we do have a lot to get to. <laughs> so just, just for helping us for time's sake, um, be super helpful if you could drop those um, in there. Um, Jennifer, just to get to the question that you had, um, on, on the social studies piece, um, or sorry, the question that we had. Um, if you have any uh, resources for suggestions for integrating data science into a K-12 social studies classroom in particular, um, either now or if you just want to drop them after the, in the chat after, um, we'd love to get some ideas. And I don't know if you have any top of mind reactions. And then Dustin, I think you had a thought. Yeah, I, yeah well, no, I was just, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna, I, I can, I've been, I've got them kind of like saved in a file. <laughs> but but one thing I could really advocate for is um, ESRI GIS um, by using that in a social studies classroom. They they give the software for free to schools and um, students can do amazing things with that. You know, combining the data and the and geographic, you know, geographic systems. That's super helpful. Um, and I, I know they, I've seen them a lot of NCSS conferences. Um, they have a lot of great educational uh, free classroom resources to give away. Um, Dustin, do you have an idea that you wanted to build from the prior conversation? Yeah, no, I was just going to build on, I think, what uh, I think it was Erwin had brought up about, you know, students not knowing the relevance because we don't talk about the why. And, you know, and I think one of the, the problems that we've faced in, in specifically our country here in the United States is that our curriculum has often been a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, there's so many standards and so many skills that teachers are expected to teach that we just become this 
in this mode of covering curriculum, right? But I think there's been a shift specifically in mathematics in trying to reimagine that and make math relevant. And I think by using relevant tasks um, and data, when you use real world data into your curriculum, students see the relevance because they're engaged in it and it's meaningful to them. So then they don't ask those questions anymore. Why are we doing this? When you introduce tasks that are relevant, you, you don't have those conversations as much as you used to. That's really helpful. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I, I think there's like so much potential, right, to get students um, involved through just uh, increasing their, their personal connections to the subject matter, um, which we're yeah, really excited to, to, to hopefully see drawn out in some of these programs as you build them. Um, Lizzie, Lizzie, I want to um, go to you because I think one of the ideas that the focus groups underscore the importance of ensuring that you know data science education is also accessible to all students, right, regardless of their background, regardless of their resources, um, and, and irrespective of their, of their interests, right. And there's a lot of ways that we can engage students through all these diverse topics. And I'm specifically thinking, I think one of the concepts that came up a lot during the focus groups was um, addressing the digital divide. <laughs> And providing equitable learning opportunities. Um, it was highlighted again and again as really crucial com infrastructure components of this work. Um, so I'm curious, you know, in your experience, uh, especially with computer science, right, and building out that infrastructure over time, as, as you mentioned some of your earlier remarks, like how do we tackle this as, as sometimes technology is a, you know, a crucial piece uh, to some of these learning outcomes, you know, that tech access isn't, isn't totally evenly distributed. Yeah, that's such an important question um, because you can have all of the plans and the most beautifully structured lessons in the world. And then if your student doesn't have Wi-Fi at home, um, they can't even engage with the lesson. So I think that, you know, the, the, the issue of accessibility, yeah, from computer science, it has been very encouraging to see a lot of curricula in, introduce offline activities, for example, and seeing teachers get creative with how to teach concepts that don't necessarily need to be done on the computer. And yet, you know, you're still engaging with really rigorous ideas. And when students have access to their devices in class, or, you know, there are down, there's maybe downloadable content that they can look at from their phone. There's just very, you know, a, a whole range of ways to allow students to engage. Um, of course, we want them to have devices and we want to advocate for connectivity in the broader community. Um, but as far as what teachers have control over, just thinking about how can I, what's the point of access for these students that I'm not able to cover? Um, so I, so one thing that comes to mind is, for example, collecting uh, raw data. And that came up. I think, Kyan, you were talking about it, um, generating your own data sets in ways that are relevant and authentic to you. So looking at your, you know, community or at even the interviewing, surveying your um, classmates, that can be a way that you you engage in the concepts without, without devices. But the other piece to it besides the technical infrastructure is culturally relevant education. And so making sure that you're in introducing projects that um, I think it's called low low floor high ceiling where students can can get in even if they like have varying widely varying skill sets they can get in on a project work with a group um, and then those students who are you know very enthusiastic and very advanced in their skills can take it away right and so we're not necessarily capping learning so being very thoughtful about project design, I think is really important to engage across, you know, skill levels, backgrounds, interests. Um, and the other thing that I would say is a great lesson to take from computer science being built out um, nationally over the last uh, couple of decades is just noticing how we started with computer science um, A, AP computer science A, which is super, super technical. Java, you have to learn how to code um, and had very, very minimal participation. Seeking to broaden access, we introduced computer science principles, right? Which covered a broader range of topics like ethics and benefits and cost to society, um, you know, modeling a little bit, networks and, and the internet. I think from, we can kind of 
take that lesson. And what I love about the chart, the course campaign is we're making it so that teachers, we're meeting teachers where they're at. Okay. So this is your content area. You don't need to teach a year long curriculum on data science, but what is a project or even a news article or, um, you know, something that, that plugs in. And I think that one thing we need to do is have sort of very, like, very clearly laid out what is your skill level teacher and what is like what's your confidence what's your skill and then also how much time do you have and so teachers can kind of slot in um with minimal effort and somebody said in the comments having a data advocate or like coach that can you know support teachers um at their district level or at their school i think would be so helpful because it's going to be so like different in each classroom um so those are some of the things that come to mind when I think about lessons from computer science and how we take that into data science. No, that's great. And, and I'm, I'm wondering like, so just especially like nailing down on that theme of like the kind of like the infrastructure the things that we have to, to shift long-term as you all reflect on this process. And this is, this is a question for all of you um, just like what, and some of the, like the work and the steps you've taken so far, um, what, like, like what excites you most about this effort? And what keeps you up most at night about the disconnect between you know the vision that we're talking about here and what excites you most and and what you fear could maybe get in the way of that thing becoming a reality. Um, you know, specifically thinking about the like, role of professional learning or uh, you know other sort of like infrastructure they have to set up set up uh, to to make this chunkable and easy, knowing that it's also some shifts involved. So you know, just curious, uh, you know, things you're most excited about, things that keep you up at night as we as we think about next steps for this work. Yeah. Okay. Kind of, do you want to go first and we'll go to Dustin? Sure. Uh, what excites me the most about this project is the collaboration. And there's such a vast level of expertise here that you don't always get to see in our everyday work lives. <laughs> so I think it's, ama it's amazing to be able to hear perspective from so many different people who have a plethora of experiences that work in different populations, even different regions of the country and different aspects. You know, it has really just in this small time that I've been a part of this, it has even changed my perspective on how I see what I do, you know, as a specialist. And I feel like we're doing it wrong. Like, that's not how it should be. Like it's this is supposed to be. We should have data science plugged in at every level, from really from lower grades all the way up. Like, why do we have to wait until high school to do it? Can we somehow simplify it at the primary level and move up so that they're getting a little bit of that? You know, so by the time they do get to high school and higher courses. It's not like, oh, wow, this is what data is. This is what it is. It's okay to have questions. Like, it's okay that the teacher doesn't know everything and that we're all asking. I mean, it's all based on inquiry and that's how we evoke change. Change starts with questions. And sometimes data leads to more questions and that's okay too. You know, sometimes those questions lead to careers and businesses and opportunities and I feel like this like what we're doing right now so I feel like I I kind of want I'm hopeful that we can somehow get turn this around like this mindset of integrating it in really from primary really and getting teachers thinking about how can I embed this in it's not an extra thing to do because you know teachers already have enough to do, but how can you in, enhance it in what you're already doing and kind of shift the lens of how we approach it so that by the time students get to higher grades, it's like, oh yeah, we've been doing this. We're just adding on, we're just adding another step on. And even as a professional, like how can I grow? How can I use data science to grow even in my expertise? Like, I think it's an incredible opportunity. So I'm excited, but I feel like we need to change this curriculum. We need to really like revamp it because this is so powerful. Yeah. We got a lot of work to do. That, that was a great, <laughs> a great rallying cry. 
Uh, Dustin, do you want to yeah. add on? Well, <laughs> I don't have a whole lot to add on after that. <laughs> she kind of pretty <laughs> much said everything. But, you know, I think this has been such an amazing experience. And I'm, I've just been so excited for the opportunity to, to work with with so many different educators across our nation. And we have such a powerful vision here, a, a vision to transform education. Um, we are in a world full of data. And how do you make our classes more relevant? It's data. Students see data every day, they engage with it, it's part of our world. So that relevancy piece is, is something that's huge for, for transforming, um, you know, how we deliver and how we approach the needs of all students. Um, with that, what does frighten me a little, little bit is that, you know, we are in this world of misinformation and there's so much data that's been pushed out there um, that's, you know, misinformed um, on both sides, uh, especially when we talk about politically. Um, and we've been in such a divisive state um, in this country. And even our social media algorithms are, are biased, right? When we think of those AI models and, and what information actually gets delivered to you um, is based on, you know, AI models and those can be biased. And But I think getting back to that, what frightens me is, is how do we have those those conversations with students around those issues that are politically divisive, how do we frame them and how do we have those conversations in a way that we're not gonna have to worry about fear of you know, attack or, or things coming back at us, right? We're, we're, we're here approaching things um, unbiasedly and looking at both sides. So I think those those are the conversations that keep me up at night because they're so difficult to have and, and the wording and how you frame them with your students is, is important. But they're important conversations that we need to have. Students need to have that data literacy early on with the large amounts of invest misinformation that's out there. They need to know how to sift through it and analyze it and determine for themselves what they're actually looking at and make their own informed decisions. Yeah, I think that's totally right. And, and I mean, gosh, like teachers don't get enough training and support for the, having those difficult conversations. But this is such a, I think as we talked about, right, at the summit, like this is such a great opportunity for it to be evidence and data-based and, and to have some some grounding so you can really do some of that work from, from, a, from you know, a starting fact base that everyone can get behind. Um, Jennifer, Lizzie, hopes and dreams, greatest fears. <laughs> Where, where's your head at as you reflect on this work so far? Yeah, if I can just, I, I think a lot of what um, Kayan and, and Dustin said is, you know, echo that a lot. But I think as particularly for social studies, um, it could really be a shift. I, I, I envision a shift from really something that's very content based in a lot of cases to something that's very hands on inquiry based and really action oriented. And so I, you know, you can dream, <laughs> but it takes it takes a mind shift. Some teachers are there and some are not. It takes a real mind shift. And I, I don't think policy is there at all with social studies. Um, you know, when you get into the maybe the very higher like economics, you you do, but you know, yeah. kids get to economics in 12th grade and they're like numbers and social studies. I've never seen this before. So we really do need the mind shift. And um I think it has great possibilities. So we'll we'll see what we can do. I, I really think thank you for this effort that that um you've organized here and thank you all for contributing to this like seriously um was he, uh, any, any other ideas here yeah um what excites me the most is seeing how students and teachers will use these skills to relate to the world in a whole different way and so just echoing back what a lot of what dustin was saying about you know looking at their communities in, an, in a data-driven way, looking at their social media feeds and questioning like the way that we receive information. I think the empowerment that comes from being able to pull back the curtain and see what's going on behind the headlines um, and to really have just the confidence to ask questions and investigate a little bit further is something that um, is sorely missing right now. And so, yeah, just seeing examples of how students are are taking, you know, taking this and running with it. Um, what kind of keeps me up at night, scares me a little bit is just 
just the overwhelm that our teachers are feeling and knowing that that not um, everyone has the support that they need to really do this in a way that does the topic justice or that, you know, they can take care of themselves at the same time while doing these extra trainings. So I feel like, you know, CSTA, the Computer Science Teachers Association did a really uh, wonderful thing um, by creating the equity fellows where they train teacher leaders and now, um, sorry, that's my baby, um, <laughs> training teacher leaders who are in their communities and embedded in there, working with, you know, their own schools to advocate and push for policy. I think that there's an opportunity potentially to do something similar with folks that want to be data leaders um, at the school level. So I think it really takes seeing, you know, your own doing the thing. Um, and so you all are doing such an amazing job getting us into these rooms and having these conversations. Um, so yeah, let's keep doing this good work. Thank you. Awesome. And, and I'm going to ask one super uh, quick lightning round question, and then we're going to go to an activity <laughs> we're going to do as a group. Um, but Lizzie, just to pick up on that theme uh, and, and thinking about like, you know, the resources that we need and, and, and thinking about like the changes and the support that teachers need to get this work done. Um, a lot of district leaders show up and watch these webinars. A lot of folks, uh, district and uh, district administrators, watch watch the recordings after the fact. Um, if you could say one thing to your districts and, and your district staff and your district leadership that you would like to see support unlocked for to, to help move this forward, like what would that thing be? And if you could pop in once you have an idea. Dustin, I saw your hand move. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just, I'm saying, listen to your teachers what are the needs and challenges that they have you know don't come in with this preset okay this is what we're going to do this is the course this is the training you're going to get hear your teachers out what are the things that they need professional development on what are the things that they're fearing the most and then hone your professional development on those specific needs um i think i think that's that's the best way to do it Yeah, I would just, I would also add to that or, you know, echo that with the professional development. Also giving teachers a chance to talk to people across districts or across schools in their own discipline. Um, and especially, I, I've i really gotten a lot out of um, going to conferences with like-minded teachers about social studies, but also other topics also. And I think there's some really great opportunities there. Again, I was lucky to be at a school that supported that. A lot of people don't get that. And there's amazing, the the amount of professional development people get from that and just the what you pick up from other teachers is it's invaluable so i think if districts really supported that and schools really supported that um they're gonna get it's gonna pay them back i want to jump in um i think one thing i would say is really keep your eyes open for opportunities to collaborate with um your you know local businesses companies uh professionals because that's where i to Irwin's point earlier the connection is often missing when the curriculum is divorced from the real world right it's when we apply the learning that we're really integrating it um and so whether that's having just speakers coming through or you know somebody showing you how they use tableau to um optimize their pricing at their company or look at historical uh climate data if you're you know in a in california like i am where there's climate you know forest fires all the time or um just anything that's relevant locally i think is going to be really helpful and then having time and space to experiment with those partnerships um, because challenges can prop up in ways that we don't expect or anticipate, um, but just kind of keeping the long-term vision um, through that. That's so awesome. Um, Kai, do you have any uh, any other ideas? Are you good? They said everything, but I, <laughs> I, I agree with everything, but I was going to add, you know, just more opportunities for students to Kind of like what Elizabeth was saying, ap application, but application close to home. Because like, you know, I work in an urban school district where a lot of students, um, they don't travel as much or they don't know other regions. But that doesn't mean that they can't apply data science locally. 
Like, how does it, to, you know, to make that connection in their backyard, so to speak? Like, how does what I'm doing in my class apply to my neighborhood or my community? And how can we evoke change through that, you know, and add the interdisciplinary piece to it? I think would be really powerful. No, that, that'd be amazing. And, and we know we need that space, right, to do that, that cross-subject collaboration. Um, awesome. Well, well, thank you all so much for the discussion tonight. Um, and thank you for your leadership, right? Honestly, it's like, it takes courage to get up and do these. It, it, take, it took a lot of time and effort to contribute to these focus groups. We ran like February to June. <laughs> I can't, the, these groups collectively, so, so the audience knows, generated uh, 327 draft learning outcomes in total. And then over a multi-month process, we narrowed it down to 25. Uh, through a lot of painstaking prioritization and voting and consensus building. And there's just a lot of energy that was poured into the, the, the beginning stages of the process. Um, and now we're going to transition to a quick activity with the last uh, four or five minutes here that we have you all for, uh, here. Um, one of the questions that was dropped in the chat, or I think submitted ahead of time, was how can I get more involved in this effort? Um, and as you all know, as we, as we shared a little bit at the beginning, um, we have this really exciting opportunity for now the whole sector to get involved and give us feedback on some of these draft learning outcomes and the draft really what we are imagining for the student experience right and like all the themes that we talked about today that are we think are just so important um so i want you all to take with the last couple of minutes we have if you haven't already take a look at the voting platform and, and the chart course tool and i'm going to walk through just really quickly how to do this um this is our landing page for the voting campaign um, and I wanted to just give another huge shout out to the many, many partners and teacher professional associations that uh, came together to build this cross subject and to do this as a partnership with us. Um, it, would, it would not be possible without their support. The, the way you access this tool is you, you hit the landing page that Shay just dropped in the chat. Uh, you click vote here under the little uh, mini ballot icon. Um, and you'll be prompted uh, with the survey uh, in, the, in the question pro tool um, to take about five to seven minutes to fill out your own personalized learning outcome ballot, right? This is going to inform uh, work that you know, many states and districts across the country um, use as a starting point to build these learning experiences. And we want your input on helping prioritize all the draft learning outcomes that these groups generated that are here on the screen. Um, so your voting directions, you have are given a total of 10 points and you are allowed to allocate those 10 points across all the draft learning outcomes that we had generated as a group. The, the speakers here on the call are probably very <laughs> familiar with me giving these instructions because we did this exercise on repeat several times internally uh, to try to draft the priorities. Um, but take a look, read through the whole list. Um, you're able to drop one to, to really even a couple points. So, so if you really like one, you know, put two or three points against it, but you only have 10 total. And you have to allocate it across these to try to pick your favorites and the, and the ones that you think are most important for students to learn by the time they graduate um, from high school. Um, so we'd really love to get your input on this process. Um, we're trying to make it wide, get really uh, you know cross sector, cross segment national feedback um, to make sure that we're built, doing this as a community. Um, so we want to make sure that your voice is counted uh, be before we close the polls uh, on October 20, uh, 15th is when, when the survey tool officially closes. Um, so if you all want to take a quick sec uh, to fill that out before we sign off here tonight. Um, and just to, again, huge thank you to our partners who help uh, pull this work together. Um, and if you have any questions as you're filling out the survey and the ballot, if, uh, the ballot tool, if you haven't already, please email us. Um, if you encounter any technical glitches, if you have trouble uh, voting, um, we want to hear from you. And there's also an opportunity as you work through the ballot to add your own learning outcome. So if you think we missed something, um, you have up to three win uh, windows um, to add your own draft learning outcomes you think should be considered for the, for the ultimate process here. Um, with that, I also want to uh, say that as an extra incentive, you all will get uh, the chart the course official I voted sticker after you complete uh, the ballot. So please uh, take a few minutes to do that and we'll, we'll send you your digital sticker so you can share it on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever your uh, favorite social media is um, to help spread the word about this process because it's really critical that we get wide feedback and that we socialize this throughout the whole sector. And speaking of social media, in case you don't know where to find us, uh, please uh, give us a follow on Twitter, LinkedIn, or our newsletter so you can stay up to date with all the things that Data Science for Everyone has going on um, so we can make sure we're shooting you the latest and greatest news uh, in our space. 
Um, and a final reminder that we have a great resource center where there's lots of classroom activities, free lesson plans, um, even data sets. Uh, so if you're really excited to try this in a couple of weeks or you're thinking about lesson plans for the second half of the school year in semester two, um, feel free to check out the resource center so uh, you can get access to a lot of great materials that folks have already built to try to you know enact this uh, in, in the classroom settings. Um, Again, a huge, huge thank you to our speakers for joining tonight and for all the contributions to this work and all the other folks, the 120 individuals who have participated in this process to date through the focus group process and the more than 570, 580, Shay, somewhere around there who have voted so far in the process. Um, thank you all so much for your input and for helping um, build this movement. 610, oh my gosh, <laughs> we're, we're growing fast. Thanks for the update. Um, again, huge thank you to you all uh, for helping us build this work nationally and to really bring these opportunities to students. Hope you all have a wonderful evening. And if we can help with anything, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out.